some of our challenges along the way and still challenges we've been facing since like uh, probably two minutes ago. Um, I am Ken Toller. This is John Callahan. How's it going? John's the Python guy. Um, built most of the tool that you'll see. Um, and kind of started this whole thing. Um, a little disclaimer, you see at the bottom, uh, we've been finding ourselves saying Aquas numbers instead of acknowledgement numbers, so you'll excuse us if that happens during the talk. Um, so let's go through the agenda. So we're going to talk about a little bit of the inspiration we had um, and why we started this project. Uh, we're going to talk about Vikings, because uh, Vikings are cool, that's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to talk about the components of the tool. Um, a little bit of TCB injection overview um, and how it kind of relates to the AppSec side of things, the UI we come up with, goals, challenges, um, where it is, the environment we're setting up, a little bit of a demo, talk about where it's going, and a lot of goals. Uh, so first, we'll talk about inspiration behind everything. Uh, John and I test a lot of .NET apps, or have tested a lot of .NET apps together. Um, and so we noticed some things with uh, how they interact with the database and what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, I noticed uh, some, you know, a lot of deployments with unencrypted database connections, people trusting the firewall, uh, and you know, being able to see that traffic. And we had some ideas about what we might be able to do with that. Uh, we obviously uh, got some SQL injection, and so that happened. Uh, so we popped open Wireshark and tried to leverage some of those skills, and with a little luck, we saw the unencrypted traffic, and we're like, man, you know, what would a Viking do with this? So uh, Vikings would, you know, probably you know, scout, right? Okay. And we found this image, and that was pretty cool because it encompasses everything that we love, rainbows, AK-47s, and Vikings, right? Um, they'd probably see all that information, do what they can with it, pillage it, um, and do that. Uh, and then finally, they would probably take all that information and, uh, and plunder, right? Yeah. So uh, I'm going to let John get into a little bit of the uh, kind of what each part of this does. Uh, turn it over to you, Ken. So, okay, so as I mentioned, the tool's kind of broken down into three different pieces from a uh, high level ideological standpoint. So the scout piece is really the piece that's pulling all the traffic off the wire. It's going through and seeing um, all the TCB, it's looking specifically at TCB connections um, that are done, established between any client and server, not just database servers. Um, and it's looking for, if it doesn't know what it is, it'll try to fingerprint it. Uh, right now, all it really supports is MySQL. We really focus on that initially. So we'll try and fingerprint the traffic and determine whether it's not MySQL. Um, and also check to see if the connection is being established against a database that you already know, or against a server that you already know to be a database server. So you don't have to worry about fingerprinting anything at all. Um, and it will track all that information for you and actually house it all for you. The, uh, so part of that as well is also go through and parcel the traffic. So if it knows it to be uh, database traffic of some sort, it will actually parse the network protocol. Say this is the request that was made, here's the response that came back. So a user login request, someone tried to log in with these credentials, a select statement was made on the database, and they had associated response with that. Yes, a row was found with these credentials, no, a row was not. Um, so it's a really easy way to pull all this really sensitive information off the wire when an unencrypted connection is being established. And that was really the um, initial inspiration behind all this. The second piece, uh, which I dubbed pillage, is the active piece of the tool, where Scout isn't interacting with anything. It's sitting completely passively on the wire, just pulling things off. No man in the middle at this point, so it's, it's just reading traffic over, over the wire. The pillage component is the actual active piece that's putting traffic on the wire. Um, what it lets you do is execute arbitrary SQL queries against the database without credentials. And this is achieved using TCP injection as its technique. Um, so, uh, we'll actually get into that. So, quick, quick two-second TCP overview. I'm sure everybody knows how it works. You know, send, send, act, act, pack is sent to establish your initial TCP handshake. Once your handshake is established, traffic starts flowing back and forth um, and track via sequence and acknowledgement numbers um, to fill, uh, make sure traffic is arriving in the correct order. You're not getting through packets of any kind or anything like that. Um, Sequence and acknowledgement numbers are predictable because they are a validation source. So the way TCP injection works is 
we're essentially putting a packet on the wire, spoofing the source IP, the source port, the destination IP, and the destination port. Um, so we have a legitimate connection, yeah, legitimate connection between a database server and a client server. Um, a connection is established, and a TCP connection is open between the two places. Go the next one. Um, and then we ourselves are sitting on a subnet in which this traffic is actively flowing over. And after once this connection has been established, we're putting this packet on the wire with a valid query, with a valid sequence number, with a valid acknowledgement number, making it look like it came from the client to the server. So when the database server receives this, it thinks it's a valid packet and tries to execute that query as if you were the actual client themselves. Um, so the strength of this is you essentially don't need credentials to execute anything. Uh, you obviously need to be on the network in the first place, so this is much more of a post-exploitation tool. But if you're on there, you have access to everything that that account has access to, and really um, lend some more credence to the ideology of least privilege. Don't run an SA on your web server. That's probably a pretty bad idea. Um, and that was really the idea behind TCP, or uh, the pillage piece of that. And then the final piece, uh, plunder, and it's just your reporting piece. There's really nothing special about that. Um, as of right now, the, the file type, or how the file outputs to is very, um, the focus was on human readability versus any kind of programmatic aspects. So it doesn't outport to like CSV or JSON or anything like that yet. It's, it was emphasized just so that you as a person go through and easily look at all the queries that have been captured, as well as some other information, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, so the UI. UI is a, it's a interactive interface. It, uh, you can actively interact with the tool as it's running. Uh, at the top, it tracks, actively tracks any known database it fingerprints or you manually enter. It will track on the number of open TCP connections it's currently looking at and the number of queries that have been captured so far. So it's just a cool little way for you to be able to see, oh, it actually is picking up traffic and seeing all these different things that are flying across your network. Um, interacting with it, you have a couple of things you can do with it right now. Uh, namely, you can dump all the file or dump all the data it's parsed so far, dump it to a text file or whatever file you want. Um, you can import a database of your own choosing. So if you happen to be doing some, um, you're already on the network, you already happen to know there's a database on this server. You don't have to wait for SQL Viking to actually fingerprint it. You can just put it in there. That way, it already knows right off the bat. Okay, this is my SQL server, and so it'll start parsing any traffic to and from that server. Um, and then the injection piece, so you can choose a query to run and then uh, the IP import you want to run it against. So once we have like all that, all those goals fleshed out, we we're trying to think of you know, how does this differ? You know, how are we different from a you know standard man in the middle attack? And so what we wanted to do, the main goals were, we want to easily read the data. We want to be able to see all that data coming back and forth over the wire. Um, without being in the middle of the connection, without creating too much of a fuss, right? We want to be as sneaky and quiet and passive as possible. And then we can take all that data offline or even while we're there. Uh, the end goal being that, you know, we can either be on the network or we can, this is like, you know, post exploitation or physical connect, physically on that subnet. Um, we can drop that, leave it there, and then pick it up a week later and see what we've got, right? That's, the, that's kind of the end, end idea there. Um, so the initial goals were we want to observe that passively with no interruption or very little interruption between the client and the server, but we want to be able to impersonate that connection from the client to the server without the server really knowing about it. Uh, and then from that, log all the relevant traffic, kind of weed out the noise, and then be able to put our own requests on the wire and you know not be so noisy as to be in, like in the middle of the actual connection. I think you can talk a little bit more about that as well. Yeah. Um, so one of the challenges, how do we differentiate all that database data, and you know, especially from how many users you have? You have 100 users and all that database data is flying back and forth, uh, and people making requests out, um, clicking on buttons, whatever they're going to do, versus all the other junk on the stuff that we don't really care about, or you know, if we're making it, if you're trying to get all this database data, we don't want to see things in our results that aren't relevant to us. Uh, the other challenge is injecting that legitimate request as a client without breaking that connection or interrupting that connection. Obviously, TCP is built-in stuff to uh, reset the connection, and uh, depending on how that is implemented, um, will we'll be uh, kind of what, what determines that. Uh, pillage right now you know, will break connections because if you inject that as a request, 
the client doesn't know what to do with it, and it sends a reset packet back, and um, in most cases, and we'll uh, reset that connection. And then with all of that data that we have, how do we organize it? Right now, like John said, it's, it's human readable, and uh, so we can look through it and, and pick it apart, but you know, how do we make it so that we can put that into another tool, or you know, CSV it out, or, or something like that that makes it a little bit more, uh, a little easier to read. And then the big challenge is getting on that network. You know, this is something that you may be a physical pen test, or if you break another box on that network uh, that has a weakness, um, that, that's probably the biggest, biggest uh, challenge there. As I mentioned before, this is very much a post-exploitation tool. Um, you use this once you're already on the network. So uh, where is it now? Uh, Scout's picking up packets. It's good to go. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned before, very much my SQL focus right now. SQL Server is in progress. It doesn't fingerprint at all, and it, you can't inject. It doesn't properly encode packets to the TDS protocol yet. Um, pillaging Beast, the Great Heathen Army, actively pillaging away, um, which, again, injects SQL requests on the wire. Uh, it's, right now, it's written in Python 2.7, uh, specifically because we leverage the Scappy library for uh, the reading and injecting packets on the wire. And Scappy right now only works on 2.7, hasn't been ported over 3 yet. Um, and it also only works on Linux. That was due to some UI hackery I had to do to make the raw input method in Python non-blocking because it is blocking, which really messes up with a interactive tool. So again, by SQL, fingerprints, parses, generates, um, generates packets, you can see everything going back and forth. There's a couple different queries that it breaks on currently we get, that we got to write some custom parsing for. Um, same thing with SQL Server. It, it'll read stuff off the wire, so if you happen to know that there's a SQL Server database on, uh, on the network, you can put it in manually and it'll start parsing data as it comes back and forth. But right now, it, doesn't, it does not fingerprint. So next is on our to-do list. So um, trying to prove this, you know, when we're sitting there and using multiple boxes, and obviously with something that is mostly with a physical attack where you're sitting on the network or if you're trying to get between the application server and the database, it's obviously not something that's easy to uh, set up in a home lab, right? Or you have to build these VMs, and you might have to have multiple databases. And as the, and we'll get into kind of the goals of the, of the tool later, but as you start expanding your, um, the amount of databases that we're going to support and kind of modularize into this, uh, we were thinking how do we best create a demo environment or an environment that you can use the tool in to test different techniques or contribute to the code or whatever it might be easily. So, with all this talk about Vagrant and all these new shops using Vagrant to spin up uh, new stuff and deployment and testing environments, uh, we thought it was a, a, a good thing to give a shot. So, right now, um, we have four uh, Vagrant boxes that are available with the tool. And those Vagrant boxes are a really simple, weak application that connects to a MySQL database that's running on a separate virtual machine. Um, and then SQL Viking in its own um, VM on that little internal network. And what that allows us to do is we can spin all those up, make changes to the code, uh, put it back into a virtual environment, and uh, continue to test. Uh, we can mess up the database, we can um, drop it and, and kind of add new data. Uh, people can take their own boxes and put them into that internal network. If you have a bigger file or something that you want to test, then you can put that on there. You can test other applications that have you know, MySQL or SQL Server right now into that environment and kind of just spin it all up together. Uh, so it's, a, it's an easy POC for us to allow us to be on a, a, a pseudo physical connection inside of, a, inside of these virtual machines. And you just bang right up whatever boxes you want, and then it will spin it all up, and then you can transmit that entire package, or if you fork it, then you can take that whole thing, give it to somebody else, and say, hey, this is what you have to fix, or whatever it might be. So it's basically SQL Viking in a box. Um, and I have, we have a, some demos we're going to go through. I'm going to try to keep it as short as possible, but I can kind of show you how the environment setup goes. So this is the environment setup, and I'm going to try to skip through as much as possible if I can. Um, I can't find my mouse. Basically, There's your Vagrant file, right? Um, 
can't say anything up there, can you? It's really small. Um, hmm. Let's do this. Let's not do that. I'll go into the terminal and increase the font size. this. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead this thing like 15 minutes long. But basically you vagrant up and you give it the command mysql weak app and sql viking and that will tell you what vagrant blocks you're going to do. It downloads all of your dependencies, libraries, uh, downloads Ruby for you for, um, for some stuff in there, downloads mysql, updates it, does all your app get stuff. Uh, then when it gets to the SQL Viking piece and the weak app piece, it'll deploy the code to each box and allow you to do that. Uh, and then once you're in there, you'll be able to vagrant SSH into SQL Viking and run as if you're on that network. The other thing that you have here is if you ever wanted to use the MySQL server for something else or you wanted to connect another app to it that you have elsewhere, uh, it also forwards that 3306 port out so that you can kind of do whatever stuff you want in the box uh, on your actual host machine. So if you have a you know, VMware or something that you want to connect to that. Um, yeah, sorry about that. You see it's spinning up Redis. Uh, and on the weak application right now, it's leveraging uh, Redis and Sidekick to kind of mimic a user. So uh, it runs a background job that just recursively kind of goes through and makes select queries and insert queries and everything so you can kind of get some feel of how the tool works and, and use it that way. Yeah. All right, so there it is. That's the, this is a really simple comment app with really screwed up font, but it's okay. Uh, and this is kind of a sample output without putting it into a text editor of what's the like it won't be. Uh, sorry. Okay, so an example of one of the things SQL Viking will pick up. Um, on the left here, I've got SQL Viking, and again, I'm sorry about the font here. Uh, and on the right, we have the application with the comments and everything going on. Uh, what's happening here? If it's going. Yeah. Uh, you see the weak app is being spun up, and during this time, the database is being built. Um, the application is running. And you see that we have 39 queries that have come up in SQL Viking, right? So SQL Viking allows you to write that out to a file. So we're writing it out to a shared folder uh, that's also on the host machine. So if I open that up, and you can see the file has changed on the host machine here. And then the text. But basically, <laughs> that's, all the, uh, that's all the creation queries. It's the create database. It's the insert queries. It's the select queries for um, the schema, the whole schema migration, and everything that's been uh, inside of, that's been done during the creation of that database. So basically, you can get SQL Viking in at the time of a database being created. You can get all of this, including what users connect to the database, uh, what users are being inserted, or, or anything like that. Um, and it'll also pick up that you know, as you as you kind of go. So if you're able to get on the network at that point when a database is created, uh, then you've got pretty much full access to everything. This is, this again is on an unencrypted connection for that particular piece. Um, this here is a demonstration of the user mimic function. So uh, this is what I was talking about with Sidekick. Side uh, that's the background job that's running all of those queries. Uh, so you go to user mimic, and then there's like a five second delay between a bunch of queries that are happening. Uh, you can see that we're, we're getting some queries in SQL bytes, and it's just listening to all that traffic passively, so that right now it's unbeknownst to the, the user. Uh, for the demo, I've, I've kind of got it putting out to the you know, console so you can see it, what's happening if you're looking at the, the web server and the console. And it's making a bunch of queries. And then if we were to, uh, once this gets finished, we'll go back to SQL Viking. You see the sidekick job is done, so that background task is, is finished. Uh, so we'll go back to the SQL Viking piece. You see that we've actually got a comment inserted there, so we know that the, the user mimic has run. Uh, again, we write that out to a file, and then you can see a bunch of gobbledygook text again.
So, yeah, so these are the select all users, and you can't see it, but right now there's you know password field, and password confirmation field. So I mean, if they're encrypted, and um, and that's that's one thing. But there's other useful data that might be in there. Uh, there's the insert statement that you'll see. There's all the query statements and the select all statements that are there as well. And um, so it kind of gives you a, a sense of what a user might be doing and a sense of the tool if you, if you fork it or, or clone it down. Does that make sense to everybody? Get the silence of the yes. The silence of the yes. Okay, um. cool. Um, so where is it going? Uh, we want all the databases, right? Right now we're MySQL and MS uh, SQL Server. Now we just did the thing that kicked off the research, right? So that's where everything really lies right now. Um, but we've realized that a lot of these implementations in, uh, in when you see databases going up, I mentioned this before. Uh, some of the assessments that I've worked on, you know, people tend to trust that the you know trust the firewall. Um, we're kind of we don't really care about the, the setup of the database and you know it being behind the firewall whether the, the traffic is there or not. You know we have these uh, only my application server can talk to my database server. So what's the big deal, right? Um, with this, since there's no real man in the middle or connection, uh, you can still kind of sit on that network and follow all this and try to try to impersonate this stuff, especially with some of these new NoSQL databases and uh, Redis and Postgres and all this other stuff and legacy databases and stuff, we, we think that this can really uh, benefit to see what's on the network that you're, that you're or what's on the subnet that you're on. Uh, we also want to try to put this into something like Pony Express, Raspberry Pi, or Ninja Star, or something like that, so we can be kind of a physical pen test tool as well. Uh, we want to package it up for easy deployment and keep it, you know, open source and have people contribute to it and say, hey, you know, we want to, we want to support this database and we want to see uh, this traffic and be able to inject into this database, how do we do it? Uh, and then obviously some of the stuff that you want to do. Yeah, so some of the other stuff we want to do was for the pillage piece specifically, to have some uh, some pre-built queries, uh, specifically stuff like SQL Server, like SP Command Shell, being able to just double binary to SQL like, you know, handle the, the dropping and execution of it, just to make things easier for a, from a user perspective. Um, some of the other Oh, actually, I'll get into that later. Um, definitely fleshing out the, the fingerprinting and parsing functionality for the two databases we're focusing on right now. Um, as, I get, as I said, MySQL is almost there. SQL Server has a little bit more work to do, but it's not too far behind either. Um, one of the big problems that I definitely foresee happening is the fact that we're tracking all TCP connections that it sees over the wire, and then that connection stops being tracked when the fin packet gets sent, so the connection no longer is there. So on an extremely busy network, that means you're trying to fingerprint and parse every single packet that comes across the wire. So I want to build in some fault tolerance. So if you fail to fingerprint a packet ten times after it's or a packet in this connection ten times, it'll stop tracking on that connection. Mark that server as not a database, and then you don't have to. It doesn't worry about it anymore. So hopefully that'll uh, result in a significant speed increase, which really is a big concern on the village part, just due to how it works. Um, also want to, again, preloaded pillage attacks and queries, um, specific to stuff for uh, like MySQL, uh, some authentication downgrade attacks, which I'll show you a screenshot in a second. Um, a lot of on automated stuff, like being able to build the schema out. So you see all these packets going across the wire, all these queries. Um, so you should be able to automatically build out what the database looks like, pull out table names, pull out users, pull out columns, um, things like that. So from a user perspective, you can, you can get the full mapping of the database just by letting this tool run and sit on the wire for a while. Eventually, you'll be able to pick up all these different pieces and build it for you, so you don't have to try to put it together yourself. Um, the preset encrypted databases in the demo. So right now, a lot of this stuff is unencrypted, right? So we, we know that that's an issue, and we want to kind of bring attention to that. Uh, but there's also some problems with, um, you know, we want to show like, how to do it right too, right? We want to be able to spin up different versions of, or different configurations of, in, of setting up an encrypted database connection inside of the demo, so that we can show you the difference of, okay, this is like really wrong, this is wrong uh, because of X, Y, and Z, but it seems right, uh, and then like how to do it right to protect yourself against uh, attacks that like this, right, or people being able to do this kind of stuff. And there's some interesting research that's coming out of that, which I think John will get to. Um, but uh, you know, we want to make it as easy as possible to spin this up as a demo and, and show you how to configure things, or at least make it 
easier to understand like where the where the encryption actually comes into play and make it an easy proof concept for for clients or upper management or whatever. Um, so some of the long-term goals again SSL. Uh, haven't done too much research with that yet. Uh, obviously, the go-to prevention for this tool to even work is to encrypt your connections. Um, however, if you were to load in the, the public-private key pairs for each the client and the server into the tool, it should be able to decrypt on the fly and still be able to see the traffic that's going back and forth. Um, I haven't looked too much into this yet, but theoretically, you could also pillage encrypted connections. You won't be able to read the response if you don't have the private key to decrypt. But if you manage to get your hands on the public key, you could still put packets on the wire and perform state changing operations. You won't be able to exfil data, but you could XP command shell, uh, or you could make some insert commands on the database and start modifying data. Um, and then specifically for MySQL, I was looking into an authentication handshake boundary attack. Uh, so MySQL 4.1 uses an extremely broken handshake protocol when uh, a client tries to authorize to it. Uh, the past, I haven't been able to find a detailed write up on why it's broken. It has something to do with the hash, it's just extremely weak and very easy to break. Um, but a lot of the MySQL 5.6, which is the one I tested against, still supports that protocol. So if you are able to inject into that handshake before it starts and tell the client to use this broken protocol, the client will respond with a broken hash, which you can go and later break on your own. So I, to try and explain this a little bit better, so I have a Wireshark picture here where you can see the, the first three packets that send in that back. So the TCP connection is getting established. And the first, the first packet that gets set out is the server to the client, indicating a bunch of information about the server itself, what kind of things it supports. Um, but the big thing it tells you is what kind of protocol to use when uh, responding back with your credential information. So if you were able to put a packet on the wire a spoof pack on the wire before the server actually sends out the real one, and instead of indicating MySQL native password, which is the modern one, indicating uh, SQL, SQL handshake 320 or something like that, I think is the name for the protocol. Uh, if you're able to specify that and send it to the client, the client should execute that uh, and send their credentials back. Obviously, the log is going to fail because the server isn't expecting that protocol, but the packet gets put on the wire all the same. You're able to pull the data out and then take the password offline and break it however it needs to be broken. Again, I haven't done too much research on how that's actually broken, but it, everything I see says do not use it. Let's see the next one. Uh, so some of the long-term goals. Uh, again, being able to pa uh, capture password hashes and salts as they're being sent across the wire. I mean, even if they aren't using a weak protocol, you can still brute force hashes or perform rainbow table attacks against them. So if you're able to pull that off, you can take it offline and do, what, do with it what you will. Um, more output formats, CSV and JSON specifically, so you can pipe this into some other something else if you want to use it. Uh, on top of that, also more input formats. Like if I could just take an nmap scan, feed it into it, and automatically pull out any any database instances it recognizes, then you don't have to worry about trying to go through it on your own, figuring out what they are, and confining it to the very specific format that SQL Viking requires when you input from a text file. Um, man and middle support. Definitely a viable vector, especially when you're doing the injection piece. If you're man in the middling, you can modify the sequence of acknowledgement numbers as they're going back and forth. That way the client and server are both happy while you are still able to actively put packets on the, or inject packets into the TCP stream and get responses back. Um, so man in the middle is extremely strong. It just requires more of a setup before you can actually use it. And that's why we kind of avoid it in the first place. We try to make this as easy as it is to do for you to, you, you're on the network, drop it, good to go, you don't have to do anything else. Um, so that's why we kind of put off the man in the middle support for a little while uh, until you flesh out some of the more uh, basic pieces. Uh, and then goals with ambition is to actually rewrite the entire tool. Uh, the reason it is being written in Python is because that was it's just one of my strongest languages from a scripting perspective. So when I was originally looking into this, I was building a bunch of POCs and stacking POCs together. I'd say, oh, this does work. Well, if I do this? And I kept kind of going until I had the tool. And I got to the point where I don't really want to rewrite this. I got 1,500 lines of code. I don't really want to touch it anymore. Um, but Python is severely limited in terms of speed. So from a, pipe or a, a pillaging perspective, I can definitely see that being an issue on enterprise-grade networks where there is a ton of traffic flying over subnets. Um, haven't run into a problem with it yet, but I can definitely see it being a possibility. Um, 
I picked Go out of no real, I didn't really have a reason other than it's an extremely fast language. Um, so that's really what the one I'm going through first, but yeah, I haven't done too much research on whether that's viable or not. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, just to kind of recap before we get into questions, I mean, this, the, the project is, is not is something that we want to kind of keep moving. Uh, we, you know, it started off as, like, like John said, something that was scripted out and then it just kind of grew and grew and grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And now we want to kind of think, okay, well, how can we step back? How can we support more databases? How can we make it, you know, more useful to consultants in the field? And how can we, um, you know, like what, what do people need? So we want to kind of bring attention to it and help you know client or clients and consultants kind of realize what the issues are in their back-end databases and then um, provide easy proofs of concept for exploitation uh, so that it's easy to prove, right? That's it, I guess. I work really fast. Yeah, actually, I actually have one more thing. Um, so I kind of wrote it with sensibility in mind. Um, within the, the directory, there's a database directory and a base DB file which kind of maps out the, structures out the six different methods you have to implement for every new database you build. That way you don't actually have to touch the main code itself, you don't have to mess with that at all. All you have to do is implement a fingerprint function, a parsing function, and a querying code function, and then the SQL wiping file will do the rest for you. It'll handle all the, all the, um, all the logic behind it. So as long as it's actually parsing, or that file is parsing it incorrectly, it's good to go. Um, which should hopefully make contributions from other people much easier, so you don't have to actually mess with the tool at all. Um, but yeah, that was it. Any questions? Uh, I do. Yes. Like, so that's fine. Like, that's a, you know, something I want to have in my, <laughs> in my workplace. So how do I defend it? Is it just SSL or? Hey, you you have, it's not just SSL. On top of that, you have to make sure it's set up correctly. Um, specifically, you want to tie keys to users. That way, um, the keys aren't getting passed over the wire. So, if a public key is exchanged on the wire, even though I won't be able to do their connections to the public key, I could definitely incorrect. Not definitely, maybe. Again, I have to look into that a little okay, bit more. Okay, so the keys, the S is out. Oh, so mm -hmm. you mentioned about weaker protocol, right? Yep. Yeah, so, that's, I mean, encryption is just the, that's it. That's the key to defeating this. But um, not a lot of organizations do that because there's such a big focus on their database performing at, um, as fast as they can. So people tend to leave encryption out as SSL slows things down pretty significantly. Any other questions? Is there a link to SQL ID or next to the book? Uh, I probably should put that in there. There is, there is a GitHub link, yes. Um, pop over in a notepad editor. <laughs> Atticus, ATTIC, USS. It's one of four repos up there. If you just get to my email page, you'll find it pretty easily. Um, please pull it down, mess with it, break it. Don't judge me because the code is pretty terrible. As I said before, this is kind of POC stack on POC, as opposed to a very clear vision from the beginning. So the code is a little bit wonky. Um, yeah. Anyone else? Go is another language that came out somewhat recently, uh, um, but I just had a couple of friends of mine who were extremely into it, told me it's amazing and extremely fast, so. Okay. Is it comparable to anything? Um, Go? I haven't written it personally, so I can tell you what the syntax is like at all. Yeah. Yeah. There's a local Go meetup. So if you go to meetup and you look for Go in the LA area, uh, they meet in here in Santa Monica once a month. Oh, cool. So. Cool. Are they I did. Um, okay. Yes. Thanks. Well, <laughs> All right. Well,
that's it. Thanks for coming out, guys.